We are stronger when we connect. 2020 has been a year of unpredictability and change. Through this, the one thing that we have all strived to maintain is connection. To connect is human. It's hardwired to our happiness. The district development model is all about connected development and innovative enterprise level information management and decision support system. Conceptualized by the South African government's Department of Cooperative Governance and piloted by the Development Bank of Southern Africa or DBSA, it has the power to strengthen alignment and break down silos. The DDM is a connector. Designed to enhance social compacting, it plays a massive role in creating inclusivity, transforming local economies, helping eliminate poverty, reducing unemployment and alleviating inequality. The district development model opens up communication lines and keeps important entities connected. On a high level, it improves cooperative governance and intergovernmental relations and coordinates resources across all three spheres of government. The DDM has been designed for the future, implementing tools for short-term COVID-19 interventions and bridging the urban-rural divide. A community-based development model, the DDM empowers the previously marginalized, giving them opportunities to play more meaningful roles in society. It is also designed to support water and sanitation needs in vulnerable areas and strengthen government's current risk adjuster strategy. This can be scaled up to meet increased needs. Using the Information Management System, or IMS, to spatially reference the government's short, medium and long-term development interventions. This real-time decision-making allows for integrated planning, budgeting and implementation of infrastructure across the country. This coordinated support will help accelerate local economic development, urbanization and economic activities on a countrywide scale. But more specifically, tailor-made solutions and the grassroots provision of basic services become far more effective and expeditious. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. The DDM can be scaled up to address the needs of the SADC region for short, medium and long-term planning. It can accelerate and increase service delivery at the coalface when disasters strike and can provide operating models for developing countries that seek more integrated approaches to their infrastructure projects. The Paris Peace Forum is an ideal platform to introduce the world to the DDM. The model integrates intelligent design with smart working methods, contributing to social advancement, inclusion, sustainability and cultural empowerment. The DDM is built on an ethos that states we are all in it together and it's this approach that will ultimately result in a paradigm shift and through this we will prove that we are stronger when we connect. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's webinar focusing on government's district development model or DDM. I'm Shannon Derejo from Crema Media Events. Thank you for taking the time to join us. The DDM was approved by Cabinet in August 2019 with the view to address the dire state of our economy and high levels of poverty, inequality and unemployment among South Africans. The DDM is intended to alleviate disjointed planning, budgeting, The DDM is, attended, is intended to alleviate disjointed planning, budgeting and implementation across the different spheres and entities of government to address these persistent socio-economic challenges by developing one plan and one budget processes, which seek to increase the efficiency on how government resources are utilized. Today's webinar will be hosted by the Department of Cooperative Governance in association with its implementing partner, the Development Bank of Southern Africa, or DBSA. Please note that the Q&A function has been enabled, so please post your questions into the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of the panel on your screen. We've disabled the chat function for the time being, so please be sure to use the Q&A for all your questions. The webinar is being recorded and a copy will be sent to you later. 
We're also streaming it live to the polity.org.za YouTube channel. Today's webinar is being moderated by Mr. Chucheka Mshlongo, Head of Local Government at the DBSA. But before I hand over to him, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Chwene Rampele, Group Executive of the Infrastructure Delivery Division at the DBSA for the welcome address. Over to you, Chwene. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shannon, um, and to everyone who has contributed to putting this dialogue session together. Um, I think as you played the, the video earlier on, it's just uh, you know, one way of connecting with the, the thousands of people that will be joining us. And I think it resonates well to say, and I joined it, uh, I mean, uh, together we can really be in a position to do more and achieve. I think from our uh, side, on behalf of the Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of the Development Bank of Southern Africa, Mr. Patrick Lemini, we extend a warm welcome to the Director General, Ms. Avril Williams, with your executive management. And to our speakers, again, Ms. Williams, uh, Mr. Temba Fossi, Prof. Skippers, we say welcome to you and the webinar, into the webinar, and looking forward to thoughtful input. To the audience or participants, we extend our humble appreciation for honoring us with your presence. Without you, this webinar would, uh, would, would really not necessarily in a, in a prevail. But ladies and gentlemen, we are hosting this webinar at a time when as a country and the world are confronted with the brutality of COVID-19 pandemic. It calls for the nation with its people and institutions to work together and employ all the necessary artillery, intellect, resources to fortify the fight against the virus and strengthen the economic and the health well-being of our beloved people of South Africa and the continent. The DBSA with COCTA and the Municipal Infrastructure Support Agency have been you know, involved in implementation of short and long-term uh, long interventions to counter the impact of COVID-19 on the vulnerable communities in the identified hotspot areas. And that you know, took a form of the provision of portable uh, solar powered boreholes, water tankers, restoration, existing boreholes and repairs of pump stations. That has been part of signaling a way of us having to contribute towards you know, you know, uh, mitigating for the, for the pandemic. And we continue also to focus on the financial state of municipalities and the disproportionate distribution of planning and project preparation capabilities. And that is in view of mitigating the impact of COVID-19. For that matter, we believe the program management units established in the provinces will make significant impact in shaping the capacity needed to achieve municipal revenue growth, infrastructure planning, preparation of projects, thus giving an opportunity for government and private sector to collaborate. It is our pleasure to partner with the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs in hosting this important public engagement on the district development model. The advent of the district development model is opportune for working together to change the lives of our people to the, to the better through quality service delivery. Secondly, the advent of this model basically begins to point us to work together to grow our economy, critical to address the pandemic of unemployment, poverty, and inequalities. And further, it actually points us to work together to build resilient and vibrant, vibrant communities that participate in local government affairs. You will agree with me when I say that as South Africa or as South Africans, we have to roll our sleeves and work together, especially at the local government level to ensure that our people receive essential basic services needed to advance the socioeconomic progress. As the DBSA, we, we come in as an organ of state, assist with their mandate of contributing to economic growth and building the institutional capacity pertinent to, to progress the fight against poverty, unemployment, and inequalities, as I said. Our commitment remains to be the trusted partner that the state can count on all the time and know we will make delivery happen. The DPS has a long track record of supporting government programs in the rollout of national initiatives. And for an example, I mean, we have rolled out the development of the renewable energy uh, independent power producer programs. We have done the accelerated schools infrastructure delivery initiative aimed at improving the learning outcomes and bringing access to education. We have further dealt with matters that relate to the development of student housing investment partnership, which is basically around the, you know, increasing the student uh, housing. And on the other side, we have, you know, made strides in terms of the rural electrification programs in the rural consumer Natal. These are some of the kind of, you know, um, evident, uh, you know, practical things that particularly happened and that has actually driven our country and made a shift in our economy. It is for this reason that the DBSA accepted the appointment as the implementing partner 
on the piloting of the district development model by COCTA in order to develop a programmatic system which ensures that government operates effectively by adopting the one plan, one budget intergovernmental approach. This will ensure fair and equitable distribution of services to some of the country's most marginalized uh, districts. On that note, in 2020, uh, the DPSA partnered with government to implement the 100 billion infrastructure fund. It is important for me to mention it at this point in time because this infrastructure fund instrument is strategic fit to achieving the vision of the DDM. Our ability to mobilize private sector to invest in the country's infrastructure is, is central to any economic recovery plan. So in this regard, we believe that the infrastructure fund is going to really be quite a very critical instrument in advancing you know, the, the, the economic development of this country. We support government's call for greater alignment, coherence, and consolidation in getting our economy back on track and creating job opportunities for our people at a local at district level. The development of one plan and associated budgets and execution plans will localize government and strengthen government proximity to the people. On behalf of the DBSA, I would like to thank COCTA once more for the opportunity of sharing with you the key facts and milestones around the DDM and what essential value added services it will bring across the three spheres of government. We trust that the dialogue will engage, we trust the dialogue will be engaging and effective in inspiring you to support the vision of DDM and ensuring that South Africa achieves the desired development impact. On that note, Shannon, I want to thank, thank you for, 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 for listening. And then uh, thank you so much. Thank you. thank you once again, and thank you for, for welcoming all the participants to this webinar. Uh, before we proceed, I would love to welcome um, uh, Ms. Avril Williamson, the DG from Pocta. She's going to set the scene for this engagement by giving us a presentation and an update on the rollout of the district development model to date. Uh, DG Avril, it's your turn to talk to us. Thank you. Um, may I get an indication if she's been able to join? Um, Shannon, are you by any chance? Uh, I can see she has joined the proceedings, but I'm not sure if she's available on the computer yet. Um, Avril, can we get an indication? Or Patrick, are you there? Doesn't seem that she's been able to join just yet. To check, would you perhaps like to move on to the panelists and yes, we can come yes, back to the please. DG yeah. once she's ready? Okay, cool, thank you. We'll then proceed to the main um, area of the program for today. Uh, I have uh, the, the honor or in the presence of three uh, panel members. Um, uh, Mr. Temba Fosi, who is the Director General, the, the Deputy Director General at National Cocta, Dr. Tracy Ledger, who is a Senior Researcher um, at the Public Affairs Research Institute, and Professor Louis Kiepers, who is the, uh, the Professor at UW School of Governance. I am going to take the three panelists and allocate 15 minutes to each one of them. As my colleague Shannon has indicated earlier, uh, participants can post their questions on the Q&A um, uh, area. In the meantime, we will unfortunately not be able to answer all the questions. Uh, we will get the, the, the opportunity to respond to some of the questions that participants would raise. I will introduce each panelist and the subject uh, that they're going to address. Um, um, and, and, and there, the three of them will speak one after the other, and then we'll de then come back to questions and answer session. The first speaker that I'm going to introduce is Mr. Temba Fosi. Mr. Fosi, the DDM is meant to raise the bar for performance of all three spheres of government by facilitating reflection on, of service delivery and development outcomes the key shifts required, bold and new paradigms, 
and innovative ideas to enable transformation, a transformative and a game-changing effect on the people, the economy, and the space of the 52 territorial areas. Considering the persistent levels of underdevelopment, poverty and inequality prevalent in the country, and the variable development track record of government over the last 26 years or so, in your opinion, is this virtuous intent of the DDM program realistic and achievable? How will a programmatic approach to cooperative governance and intergovernmental relations practically assist in this regard? The participants will want to hear your opinions on this matter. Mr. Fossey, the stage is yours. Please proceed. Uh, you thanks. Are, uh, you are muted. Thank you. Okay. Can you, am I audible? Yes, you are. Right. Okay. No, thanks, uh, Chucheka. And uh, good afternoon to my fellow panelists uh, and then all the, the participants uh, in this webinar. Um, and then and, and thanks to, to the organizers uh, overall of, of, of this uh, session. Uh, I think the, the the context that you've given in terms of the question uh, that you've asked uh, to check uh, requires that I think one starts by explaining firstly the context of the DDM uh, in terms of the constitution and the legislation. Uh, so, so DDM is not really one of the many uh, local government programs that have been tried and tested uh, before. It is predicated uh, on the constitution in terms of chapter three of the constitution on cooperative governance and then and, and also uh, intergovernmental relations framework act. And in that act, the object of that act uh, provides for a, a coherent government uh, for the Republic effective provision of services, uh, monitoring and implementation of, of, of legislation and realization of, of national uh, uh, priorities. And if you look at uh, chapter three of the constitution, it defines uh, the principles that should guide how the three spheres of government must work together in providing for this uh, coherent or cohesive state action in municipal spaces. So, so the DDM is it, basically a, an operational model uh, uh, that provides for a programmatic way of how the three spheres of government can, can coordinate their efforts in responding to, to the, the, the perennial sort of challenges that we're facing as a country in terms of the triple challenges of uh, poverty, unemployment, and inequality. And, and, and uh, how it does this is guided by three important principles. Firstly, it's the principle of people-centered uh, development. Uh, people-centered development, it basically means that we need to create and build more functional and livable spaces uh, in terms of villages, towns, and cities. Uh, and creating these functional and livable uh, spaces requires that we, we invest in the right uh, places informed by the demographics and the spatial trends of these areas and ensure that we create these integrated communities where we're able then to unlock uh, economic opportunities, social, cultural, uh, that responds to, to the needs uh, of, of, of those communities. And, 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 and the, the second principle, it's a principle of specialization. Specialization is basically about uh, accounting and translating programs and budgets of spheres and departments uh, and map them into spatial locations. Uh, so national departments must account for their budgets and programs and investment in specific spaces. It introduces a, a special logic in how we respond to, to the realities and, and challenges that our people are facing. Uh, the third principle, it's a principle around reprioritization. Reprioritization is basically the process of, of uh, reviewing and changing plans and budget 
uh, to realize these desired sort of physical and integrated impacts in the uh, uh, 52 spaces. So when cabinet uh, approved uh, the district development model, it also approved that we, we should coordinate all of government in the 52 spaces. The 52 spaces are made up of the 44 district uh, municipalities and, and, and the eight metros. And we talk about district spaces, we're not necessarily just referring to the district as an institution. We're talking of the geographic space overall in terms of the district space, because that's, that's the space that, that where our people live. And if you want to respond to, to the challenges of uh, uh, the triple challenges, we need to understand the challenges uh, on the ground. So the DDM, what it does, we, we start by developing a profile. The profile, it's a, it's, a, it's a comprehensive state of development of each of the 52 spaces. Uh, it's informed by uh, a, a comprehensive set of indicators from, from the understanding the population of that district, uh, poverty levels, education levels, uh, uh, crime, health status, the infrastructure uh, needs of that space. So it's a very comprehensive, it gives you a comprehensive set of the state of development of each district. But it also goes beyond that to look at uh, the endowment structure of that district. Uh, what does it have? Uh, what, what opportunities and potential of each of those districts? Uh, its competitive advantages uh, and, and how it links up with the neighboring districts uh, how it, li it links up to the economy, the provincial economy, and also the, the national economy, including beyond the, the borders of, of, of South Africa. So that profile, it basically constitutes a baseline uh, which all of government must uh, uh, plan. So all the plans of the three spheres must be informed by the same data uh, and evidence of the extent of the challenge that, that, that we have to respond to as government. And, and the second point that the, 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 the DDM is, 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 is introducing, it's a, a one plan. The one plan, it's meant then to express clear commitment of and budgets of all of these three spheres in terms of uh, what needs to be done. So if you take the, the uh, any district, the, the extent of, of uh, unemployment, uh, poverty, the, 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 the one plan will then express what contribution will local government be making in relation to that, what uh, provincial government and all the different sort of sectors of, of at national level, what contribution are they going to make uh, in relation to that. On the infrastructure, you can look at all the different uh, areas. But the one plan is meant to be also express a long-term view uh, as we know that as a country, we have a national development plan and that national development plan, it can only be implemented if it's translated and expressed in these 52 spaces, because that's where the growth uh, of the economic growth of the country will come from. That's where social and economic development of our people will actually be. These activities are happening at a local level. So these geographic, 52 geographic spaces become the critical sort of points and convergence of all of government in responding to, to the realities that our people are facing. But I think the, the critical point to make is, is that uh, the DDM as a game changer, it, 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 it basically introduces a, a, a new way of working to ensure that as the different spheres state entities, but also civil society, as we work in unison, ensuring that uh, we're focused in a uh, responsive way to the challenges. We're able then to, to mobilize all the different uh, sectors of society. So it's not just a government uh, uh, approach. Uh, in, uh, when the, the, the cabinet approved uh, the DDM, we also, it also approved that we should pilot it in three districts, uh, Oartambo, uh, Waterbeck, and Eteguin. And in the engagements that we've, we've had with these districts uh, as part of the piloting, 
we've also engaged uh, various stakeholders, uh, business, youth, uh, women, uh, different sort of sectors of, of uh, civil society, so that there, there is a shared uh, and a common set of objectives that we can all agree to that expresses uh, the kind of a future that we want to see in these places. And interestingly that uh, when we were engaging with these uh, pilots, uh, so if you look at, we take OR Tambo as an example, the, the paradox of, of OR Tambo, it's, it's one of the top 10 poorest districts in the country, uh, but it's also uh, a, a, a district that is uh, very rich. Uh, it's a jewel of the Eastern Cape in terms of uh, the potential agriculture, tourism and the oceans economy provide. Uh, the, the, if you look at agriculture, only it contributes only 2% to, to the GDP of that district. So it has a huge tracts of land, vast tracts of land, uh, but it, there's not much sort of agricultural activities that are taking place there. Uh, you look at the, the oceans economy, pristine and uh, unspoiled beaches that uh, nothing much is happening. Uh, the potential of tourism in terms of the natural endowment uh, in that area. All of these cannot be unlocked by that district alone. You need provincial government to clearly say what contributions are they going to make. Uh, your key sector departments, agriculture, tourism, uh, uh, environment, fisheries, all these departments are critical to, to assisting and working with that municipality in that unlocking that potential. But also you, you have uh, communities, which is the important point uh, when I talk about people-centered development. When you talk about unlocking these economic opportunities, you then also need to look at how are these uh, economic activities going to generate uh, a benefit to local uh, communities? How are small businesses in that area going to benefit from the agro-processing opportunities that will come with cannabis in, in, in that area, from tourism, the oceans economy, uh, but, but also you, you have through expressed through the one plan, there's a common set of objectives that are shared by all of us uh, as the three spheres of what needs to be done. There are clear budget commitments uh, to what needs to be done for the plan of that district and the private sector and different sort of civil society formations that are located in that district also have a clear sense of what future uh, uh, they want to achieve in, in that district in terms of turning the, the opportunity. So that, that, that's a very critical sort of uh, uh, new approach that, that the DDM provides. Uh, and, and the lessons that we, we, we have learned from these uh, pilots, uh, if, if we look at the past 25 years, uh, our cooperative governance uh, is it clearly still characterized by silos, uh, fragmentation, and duplication in how the three spheres were, uh, including uh, uh, poor utilization of the resources uh, of the, the various spheres. Uh, and, and you can look at, you can measure that in, in different uh, uh, areas uh, where there's no spatial logic that is informed by the needs on the ground, where there are schools that are built in areas where you have fewer learners. Uh, uh, so, so it's about really moving away uh, and, and beyond just delivering uh, outputs like houses, uh, schools, uh, individual services, to ensuring that we build these more functional uh, and livable spaces that provide economic opportunities uh, for, for our people. And if all of us are then working towards and guided by the same sort of uh, vision, we're able to mobilize all of government to focus uh, in these uh, spaces. I, th I think one of the, the areas that uh, as a country we, we have not invested in, we have not invested in, in looking at the uh, uh, mechanisms uh, for, for and building sort of implementation capability. Uh, we have sound policies, uh, sound structures uh, and, and so on that have been established across uh, the three spheres. 
but the implementation capability has not been unpacked to a level of saying, this is how we need to plan as the three years. Uh, this is how the, the budgets must be aligned, which is why it's important for, for the DDM that when you're talking about integrated planning, uh, integrated budgeting, uh, and, and spatially coordinated uh, uh, implementation, it expresses all of what government needs to do. Uh, it's not just the individual or uh, sectors expressing what they want to do in a particular space, but it's expressed in one plan that, that can be utilized also as an accountability measure to, to, to assess to what extent has each sphere, each sector department contributed to achieving a set uh, objectives in a municipal space. When the IDPs of municipalities were conceptualized, they, they were meant to actually play this role and, and be an instrument that all of expresses all of government. But as we know, the past 25 years, uh, IDPs have basically become a municipal plan. Uh, sector departments from the other spheres have not really participated in ensuring that uh, they, they express clear uh, uh, co budget commitments. So, so the DDM then becomes sort of the, the, uh, an intergovernmental instrument that provides us with the programmatic way of how we, 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 we look at uh, these challenges. The other important uh, and critical factor is the issue of the state of municipalities. Uh, we know that uh, there are challenges with, with the state of our municipalities. And one of the approaches that uh, through the DDM that we have adopted uh, in the pilots, we have also, in addition to the comprehensive profile that I referred to earlier, we have also done detailed diagnostic studies to look at the institutional capacity and capability of these districts particularly in the critical areas of performance, uh, financial management, infrastructure delivery. Uh, so we know in terms of the skills, in terms of individuals, but also what systems uh, do they have? What's the state of infrastructure uh, in this district and what is required to address those challenges? So that, that assists us then to, to also coordinate all your capacity building programs, including ensuring that there's a coordinated way to how we respond to, to capacity challenges that uh, uh, these uh, municipalities are facing. So the local government sort of stabilization program is also going to be informed by, by, by these uh, profiles where we have a, a good sense of what's the state of the finances, uh, what's the state of the infrastructure, but also institutionally, what skills do they have? The organograms, do they have the right people with the right skills to, to, to actually perform uh, the, 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 the required sort of responsibilities. So, and, and uh, of course, when, when, we, when, when, when COVID hits us, uh, uh, hit us last year, we, we, we also learned from, from the challenges that uh, uh, COVID brought. It, it exposed uh, some of the fault lines in terms of the extent of, of uh, poverty, unemployment and inequality in this country. And, and for the first time, uh, our intergovernmental machinery has been very effective in the coordination of the COVID response plans. Uh, uh, the, the regular sort of uh, reporting lines that are coordinated effectively from the district command councils to the provincial command councils, and also at national level, including how all the, the, the um, the packages, uh, response packages to addressing some of the challenges of COVID have been coordinated across the three spheres. So the DDM is also building on, on, on those lessons to ensure that uh, the economic recovery plans post COVID are responding to, to the fundamental challenges that will have been brought uh, by, by uh, COVID. We, 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 we have also established uh, 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 hubs, uh, which will play a, a very central role of coordinating all of government. These hubs will ensure that uh, all the, uh, the efforts of the various spheres, various sort of sectors of, of society are coordinated centrally in terms of their response to, to the challenges. 
uh, of each district and uh, based on the, 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 the priorities that would have been identified in the one plan. Uh, so we continue to, to establish partnerships with various uh, stakeholders, uh, big business, uh, uh, research institutions, uh, universities, uh, to ensure that uh, we also uh, uh, improve the, the, the data uh, and, uh, and, and evidence-based sort of information to inform and strengthen uh, the, 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 the prioritization processes uh, and planning processes uh, at, at the municipal level. And, and I think, uh, Chair, lastly, uh, we, 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 we will continue uh, as, as the department. This is the first round of these uh, one plan. So it's the first generation of the one plan. Uh, and then in the context of, of the, the, the start of this program, we want to focus on ensuring that we, we, we look at catalytic projects that are going to anchor uh, our response to the impact of COVID in terms of responding concretely now to, to the socioeconomic conditions, uh, deploy sort of labor intensive uh, interventions in terms of infrastructure rollout, but also begin to look at concretely community-based economic uh, development initiatives that uh, provides uh, opportunities for our people through support for small businesses, creation of co cooperatives, uh, support to child and, and women headed household, uh, so that we, we also move away from just the macro uh, focus on debating economic concept to actually translating these concept into opportunities that are actually available in the 52 spaces, which ultimately are the opportunities that will drive growth uh, in the country and, and the development of this nation and achieve the goals that we have set in the National uh, Development Plan. Uh, th thank you, Chair. <clears throat> thank you, Tamba. Thank you. Um, and thank you for being pointed and just being within the time itself allocated to you. Um, I once again want to remind the participants that I'll proceed to the next uh, speaker. Uh, I am receiving um, a lot of questions already, Temba, uh, and comments that I'm going to share with you later, um, and you can respond at the appropriate time. I'm now going to take Dr. Tracy Ledger. Dr. Ledger, the one plans that Temba has already referred to in his presentation, as one of the key instruments of the DDM implementation must be based on credible processes, engagements, information, data, and studies. There should be objective reliance on the best available information as part of the repeat yet well-considered decision-making and planning. What is generally understood by evidence-based planning? And does the public sector have the requisite internal capacity to really deepen and institutionalize evidence-based planning and decision-making in the intergovernmental system in South Africa to bolster the development impact. Dr. Leja, based on this question, the stage is yours. Thank you very much and um, good afternoon, everyone. So, I mean, the, the district development model, as we've been told in the introduction, it's, it's an intergovernmental relations-based solution to achieving the goal of developmental local government. And, and local government is absolutely key to to achieving some of the most important developmental and transformational goals that, that as a country we, we collectively have. But clearly things have not panned out the, the way that, that we have hoped or the way that we have expected. I think this is no, no secret. In, in his closing remarks at the weekend Hotla, the president said that the Hotla emphasized the centrality of addressing all challenges in local government towards economic development and improving the lives of South Africans. I'm going to very briefly try and address two very big issues. Um, firstly, what is the evidence-based planning that we need to ensure that the district development model can achieve its goals? 
Secondly, do we have the internal capability to do this planning? And here I'm expressly using the term capability instead of capacity. I'm echoing the comments of the DDG and reflecting the language of the National Development Plan. Capability forces us to think about the context within which capacity is applied. And so it's, it's often a much more useful way of understanding the, the challenges that, that we face. So the real question is, do we have the capability to produce good and relevant plans? Do we have the capability within the state to ensure that the district development model is actually going to achieve the challenges that it is setting out to achieve? To paraphrase, if I, if I might be so bold, the, the comments of the president, do we have what it takes to address all the challenges that we face? Do we know what it takes to address all of these challenges? Now, in respect of evidence-based planning, the general understanding is that you need accurate and detailed information, which is the evidence, in order to develop good plans. And this is necessary to ensure that your, your plans are anchored in the reality of the socio-economic environment in which you find yourself, um, and the environment that you are planning to impact. But the main purpose of this evidence is to enable effective decision making. That is, the information on its own has no intrinsic value. It's only useful as an input into effective decision making. And that means we need to think very carefully, we believe, about two issues over and above the detailed spatial, demographic and economic data that we, that we normally think about. Um, the first um, is that all planning in the public sector involves trade-offs. We operate in a resource-constrained environment, at the present more so probably than, than any time in our history. That means we have to choose among multiple outputs. We can't afford to deliver everything, so how do we decide what to deliver? Because when we decide to deliver something, at the same time we're deciding not to deliver something else. This is the critical issue of prioritization. On what basis do we decide to do some things and not on other things? What kind of evidence do we need in order to make choices about the best use of our resources? And this is one of the shortcomings of the current planning processes, which is based on responding um, to, to all articulated community needs and doesn't always incorporate a clear and detailed prioritization method. So you might have a community in one ward and, and they have a particular set of priorities. The, there are clearly things that they want. And then you go to the ward next door and the community there would like you to deliver other things. So how do you choose what you are going to do and what you are going to do? The result at the moment is that many municipalities, especially smaller municipalities that have limited resources, they try and do a little bit of everything to try and meet everybody's um, requirements and demands with predictable results. Now this problem is probably going to be compounded. So instead of trying to balance the interests of 10 wards, we're now trying to balance the interests of, of 40 or, or, or 50 wards. So we need to incorporate a clear evidence-based model of prioritization. And very importantly, this needs to be transparent so that communities understand I am not getting the, the thing that I articulated as the priority in my community, but the reason for that is that something which I now understand is more important. So that the community who wants a community center is then part of the decision making to understand that actually we need to invest that money into long-term water infrastructure or sanitation infrastructure. So it's really important that we can manage communities' expectations by making this prioritization model um, much more tra transparent. The second set of evidence um, is, is one that's generally in short supply across the entire state and, and in many countries. It's the information that can tell us in a clear and detailed fashion why some programs achieve their goals and why others do not. This is evidence of causality. Evidence that will tell us if we choose these inputs and these activities, we will have the greatest likelihood of, of meeting our goals. This is exactly the kind of evidence that we, that we need, what works and what doesn't work. And we desperately need that evidence in order to ensure the possibility that we are actually going to achieve our, goal, our goals. We need to have the ability, the capability, to undertake this critical analysis of causality. If I do X, Y is the most likely thing to happen. We need to increase our understanding of what makes things work or not work 
and then be able to make decisions about resource allocation based on what we know about what works and what doesn't work. And that brings me to, to, the, to the central issue. That is of the internal capability required to produce the kinds of plans that will move us towards our collective goals. Drawing up evidence-based plans of the outputs and outcomes we want to achieve, no matter how good and detailed and relevant and prioritized they are, is in fact only one part of a comprehensive planning process, although we all think of it, many of us think of it as, as the entire process. No matter how relevant and good the list of outputs and outcomes that we want to achieve, no matter how good the evidence we've used to come up with that, it is all meaningless if we cannot actually implement it. And here I want to underscore what the DDG has said about the importance of implementation capability. If we cannot actually implement these plans, then all we will have is a very big pile of paper. And it's a very well-known South African mantra. We have, we have wonderful policy and plans, but we don't implement them. The critical point here is that we need to plan for implementation. We need to have detailed plans for exactly how we are going to achieve our selected goals and outputs. Who is going to do what? Especially in a district development model, who is responsible? Which organization, which individual is responsible for doing something? By when are they responsible for doing it? What systems and processes and technology do we need to ensure that we move in the right direction? That's the kind of planning that we seldom do. We, we've got in South Africa this just do it mentality across the state, that all we need to do is produce a good plan, detailing all the things we want to achieve, and then these things um, will be will appear. Most importantly, often we don't pay enough attention to the capability of the state to actually implement our plans. What do we actually need to get things done? And so we don't plan to make sure that this capability is in place right from the very start, not a couple of years um, down the line. We have to plan to make sure that we have got what it takes to, to achieve our goals. So my closing remarks are that in, in, in my assessments, the, the, the most important gaps in, in capability that we need to address are in the implementation of the plans that are produced um, under the, the DDM. We need to critically start thinking of implementation as an integral part of the planning process, not something that happens after the planning process, but something that is specifically incorporated into the planning process, not something that magically happens um, after, after the fact. And if we don't plan for this effective implementation, if we don't plan to improve the implementation capability of the state, then we will never address our challenges. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Checker, you seem to be on mute. Yeah, I was on mute. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ledger. Um, I want us to proceed to the last speaker, and then we'll come back again to take a number of questions that I already see have been posted. Professor Louis Kiepers, um, intergovernmental planning and alignment are a complex process that have not been successfully achieved and institutionalized thus far. Furthermore, over the years, there have been many attempts and processes to align the plethora of plans including special targeting approaches, which have yielded some variable success. Is the shift in focus from the alignment of the plans to joint planning as advocated by the DDM and the DDG of COCTA today attainable? If so, how can this be best orchestrated? The stage is yours, uh, Professor Skippers. Thank you very much, uh, Chucheka, and good afternoon from my side as well. It's an honor to be part of this dialogue session uh, this afternoon. Um, I used to have a boss that said, the day that I can write a report is the day I can write a report on the back of a matchbox. And I think we, we've got the verbal version of that today because in 15 minutes, we've got to say such a lot of things. Um, so it's important that we, that, that, that we are uh, prioritizing what, you know, in what, what we have to say. I want to start off by reading to you two paragraphs, um, and it goes as follows. Irregularities and abuses attaching to the collection of taxes had led to the recent dismissal and prosecution of the town treasurer and to the suspension of the municipal controller and auditor. And they held out no hope of permanent improvement in the town's administration, 
financial or otherwise, its members could not give sufficient attention to the day-to-day -day execution of municipal affairs, nor resist the effect of those corrupt or servile influences by which the interest of the public committed to their charge had been compromised. That's the first paragraph. I want to read the second one. The great majority of people in South Africa have some vague idea that local government is not on a sound basis. Not fully understanding the present system, they are at a loss as to what is wrong. Generally, the tendency is to blame the councillors or the officials. The fault is sought with persons and not with systems. Now, if I ask you to date those two paragraphs to me, I think most of us would probably say it's contemporary, right? It's, it's, it's at the moment. But actually, the first paragraph is quoted in a book written by a person called Green and that was published in 1957 referring to a commission of inquiry that was established in 1826. The second paragraph comes from a, a book from a person called, called Floyd, published in 1952. And I think what we, can, what we can glean from these two paragraphs and when they were written, what they refer to, is that the question of local government capacity is an enduring challenge in South Africa and that we need to start looking for sustainable solutions to those problems, otherwise, We'll sit here 50 years from now. Probably we won't sit here 50 years from now, but people will sit here 50 years from now and still struggle with the same with the same issues that, that we're struggling with now. So we've got to look for those enduring and for those long-term and sustainable solutions um, to deal with, with the problem of capacity. I think it's important that we say to ourselves that since 1994, there's been massive improvements in the lives of, of people that, that are served by local government. If we don't say that to each other, I think we're not, we're not honest. But I think at the same time, I think we'll be lying to ourselves if we say that the, the, the trajectory of local government is positive, right? So even though we've had very good progress and we can look at the numbers, you know, the number of people that, that have access to, to water and to sewage and electricity and refuse removal and those kinds of things. But we know at the same time that when we look at governance and, 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 and other um, metrics, that, that there is an issue that, that we need to talk about. So if we look at capacity, if we look at capacity, for me, capacity consists of two equal things. The one without the other uh, gives you a lack of capacity. So on the one hand, capacity is about the ability to do things, right? You are able to do certain things. But on the other end, in terms of the context that we talk about, in terms of local government and in terms of, 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 of public administration and public, the public sector as a whole, in addition to the ability to do things, you also need to have the will to do things or the political will to do things. Right? So those two things together is what, 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 gives, you, what gives you local government uh, capacity. So I want to look back from 1994, just look at, at, at what, what are some of the, the programs um, and the strategies that, that, were, that were implemented. Um, just do a little bit of a look at whether they were successful or not. And then get to the point of, you know, the current, the DDA model and, and look at, at its implementation. I want to be very practical about what should be done in order for the, for the district development model to, to, to be successful and to be and to achieve what it sets out to achieve. I think it's important, it's been mentioned before today, but it's important that we understand that we're talking within the context of the developmental state and developmental local government and the national development plan. I think that, that's the broad uh, and, and overarching um, theoretical perspective that, that we have on uh, what, what, when, when we talk about these things. So over the years, there's been quite a number of of programs and, and, and support programs and spatial planning initiatives that have been implemented. So we've had in 2004, a mere four years after the democratic system of local government came to being, we've had Project Consolidate. So four years after the implementation of democratic local government, national government felt the need to implement a program to support local government, right? So, so that was Project Consolidate. Then in Zamanji in 2006, a support initiative by the Development Bank of Southern Africa to support Project Consolidate, 2006. In 2009, we've had the local government turnaround strategy, 
In 2014, we've had the back to basic strategy. On the spatial planning side, um, we've had the National Spatial Development Framework that was proposed by the RDP office in 1995. We've had the Spatial Development Initiative that looked at an example of that would be the Maputo uh, Pretoria Gaborone uh, Walfers Bay Corridor. And then we've also had the National Spatial Development Perspective. So there's been a number of, of, of attempts over the years. But if we look at you know, whether these strategies and plans and attempts were successful, I would say that there are a few things that stand out um, in these things. The one is that over the years, there's been incoherent planning and budgeting and implementation. So even though there's been efforts at different levels, there was not this comprehensive and overarching and, and working together in terms of, 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 of you know, the efforts aimed at, at improving the local government system. From a local government perspective, now that's where I come from. I'm a municipal official in my bones. Um, I think most municipalities will tell you that we struggle to get provincial and national departments to participate in our, in our, in our uh, IDP processes, uh, in the municipal planning processes, right? To meaning, meaningfully participate. Where they do participate, you often find lower level staff that are being sent and, and without real uh, mandates to, to, to participate fully in, into those, right? The other thing that we often find is that, and this, this is especially linked to when you, you, you find new office bearers coming into, into, in, 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 into office, is a change in strategy and priorities. So there's a lot of short-termism that, that is happening. We, we do not you know, commit ourselves over the long term to, to a particular uh, uh, strategy or approach. So we change that all along. There's a one size fits all approach that, that we can also see through, throughout the, the time, right? Tracy uh, spoke about this to, 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 to a large extent now, but there's not always been evidence-based uh, planning and implementation. And often there was a lack of, of a development logic with, within, within those things. So having said all of that, I think we can say that the local government system as it is at the moment faces a few challenges. I want to just mention four. I mean, there are others, they're, 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 they're more than this, but, but the four that stands out for me is the following one. It has a very complex legislative environment. Um, there are some writers that have spoken about the strangulation of local government and not the regulation of local government, right? We all, for me also, the demarcation of local government is, is an issue. There's this whole, and I know that I swim against the tide in terms of this, but this notion that bigger is always better for me is a problem. I think sometimes the way that municipalities are put together, sometimes the way that they are demarcated leads uh, to a lot of uh, uh, challenges in the municipalities. We know that the fiscal and financial capacity of most municipalities is a problem. You know, the ability to, to raise the revenue that is due to them and to then utilize the, that, that revenue properly, I think is an issue. And then lastly, the skills and capacity of local government, political and administrative leadership, I, I think is also, is also an issue that, that, that needs uh, um, attention. So now I want to come to the district development models. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. It's been said already, I think DDG uh, 4C has, has, has explained to us what the district development model is, but let me just say a few words on that. It's an operational model, right? So it's not a pie in the sky. It's something that needs to be implemented. It's an operational model for improving cooperative governance aimed at building a capable um, ethical and developmental state. Straight from the, the, the constitution, it's nothing new. It should have been there from the adoption of the constitution. These are the things that underpin our system of government um, and the way that the three spheres of government should be, should be working together. The question is, have we had the implementation protocols and have we had, have, have, our, our, have our, our, our strategies and our plans really taken a, a, a notice of, of, of these constitutional requirements? I think the DDM brings us there, it allows us the, the opportunity to make practical what the, what the constitution says about integrated government, right? A very important part of, of the district development model is um, 
you know, this whole notion of that there are three critical components, people, economy, and space, and that we need to bring those three uh, together in, 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 in what we talk about. That's about people, that's people-centered, but you cannot talk about improving the lives of people without looking at the economy and without spatializing what it is that, 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 that you want to do. So, so that's important. A key change in the DDM as opposed to previous uh, uh, models and, and previous strategies is the move away from alignment to joint planning. I think that's, that's critical and that's key. Now we need to talk about what joint planning is. Um, and joint planning, just like strategic planning, is a concept that has come from the military environment and that we've brought over to the, to the, to the civilian environment. So in joint planning, right, um, what we do is we bring different groups together to address a common enemy. And the common enemy in the South African context is the triple challenge of unemployment, poverty, and inequality. So the joint planning approach says, let's bring all our resources together and not align our plans, because if we align our plans, it means that we've got different plans and we're just trying to, to make them fit together. But let's rather jointly work towards um, identifying what the things are that we, that, that we should do um, in order to, to address that, uh, that triple challenge that, that, we face in, that, that, that we face. So the one plan is that tool that brings joint planning to life in the DDM. Um, all actors, local, provincial, and national, will, in the one plan and one budget uh, uh, process, will jointly determine what the long-term strategic framework is that will guide investment, service delivery, and development in each of the geographic theaters of the DDM. And this should uh, uh, result in more efficient resource allocation and implementation. COVID-19 has given us an opportunity. It's a pandemic. It's, 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 it's been a negative thing for the world, but it's also given us an opportunity to have a real look at how we, how we, how we approach uh, um, um, the challenges that we face. And we've worked on, on, on approach to that. And we say that addressing COVID-19, but then also addressing all other uh, challenges that, that, that institutions and that countries face. You've got to do three things. That's a three phased approach in our opinion, right? One is you've got to respond to it. After you've responded to it, you've got to reset. You've got to, after the response, make sure that you reset and, 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 and change what needs to be changed. And the last phase is to rebound from it. So in other words, to learn to, to, after you've responded and you've reset, to take the, the lessons and, and, and rebound and, and and get into a, a better space. I want to, to get to what I think are the things that we should focus on if we want to make the DDM um, um, successful. The DDM provides us with a national strategic framework, but it should be adapted to the practical reali realities of each of the geographic spaces in which the DDM will find expression. If we're going to have a one size fits all approach, I think we're gonna, we're gonna repeat some of the mistakes that we've made before, right? I think it's important that we ensure that the capacity, and remember I said, this is the ability and the will, is available to ensure the successful implementation. We must also work towards a national compact to insulate the approach from change as soon as a new political leadership is installed, right? I, I think for me, that's critical. We, we must make sure that we do not, you know, change our strategies and our plans going forward all the time. It's important that we put in place proper uh, IGR protocols so that all the participating institutions and individuals understand their respective roles and what is expected of them. We must ensure that the one plans get expression in our budget and our performance agreements, because otherwise, like Tracy, Tracy said, we'll sit with a pile of paper meaning absolutely nothing. I think that's important. It's also important that we track spatial impact over time so that we can see the progress and so that we can see where we need to improve or, or change what should, be, what should be done. The long-term vision should be underpinned by short and medium-term action plans. And we should have continuous uh, monitoring and evaluation that, that underpins all of this. Then also what we need to, to focus on or, or need to ensure is that we're adaptable. 
So as the environment change, I know, I think we're all aware of the fact that we, that, that we live in, 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 in challenging times and in environments that change a lot, we need to be adaptable in, in that respect. And then the last point that I want to make, if we want to make the DDM a successful, uh, uh, get successful implementation, is that we make sure that we are on the, on the cutting edge of technological advancement. So we bring the te technology into the space and we make use of it. I mean, drone technology um, is one of those things that I think will assist us in, in terms of, of, of improving the evidence that we have. If we just see our, our drones, for instance, now make, you know, improving our, 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 our spatial information uh, better. Uh, it allows us to see how, how uh, 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 the spatial or, or the spaces that we work in change over time, for instance. But that's important that, that we remain on the cutting edge of that technological uh, uh, environment. I think the DDM model in, in closing provides a lot of opportunity um, to improve the overall ability of the state. Local government is important. Um, I had a, a, a speaker in previous times, he's unfortunately, unfortunately passed away last year, speaker Brian Nakadin that, that used to say, local government is not the, only the sphere of government that is closest to the people, but it's also the sphere of government where the people are closest to government. So if we get government, if we get local government to work properly, I think we'll, 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 work, we'll, we'll move far to, 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 to get the state. To be to be perceived as, as more successful by the people that uh, that that we that we all jointly serve. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the questions uh, that will come. Thanks a lot, uh, Chucheka. Thank you, thank, thank you, uh, Professor Louis. Um, we've come to the most important part where people are closer to the panel and the panelists. Uh, and the, it's now the people that are now talking to the panelists. And I have a set of questions that have been raised by the participants. We'll not be able to answer all of them, but I want to read a few of them and ask you as panelists to attend to them. And, and I will, I'll use my discretion to distribute the questions if you don't look at me, I choose you as the panel. <laughs> so one of the, some of the important questions that are being asked, uh, Temba, are uh, there is an emphasis of, uh, of moving from alignment to joint planning. The question that is being posed is what behavioral or cultural changes are required to make these changes? Is there a baseline assessment available of where the different departments and spheres of government stand at the moment? I'll ask that uh, Temba, this, this question I think is directed more at your emphasis around the DDM being uh, my moving away from alignment to joint planning. Where is government standing at the moment? Where are the spheres of government standing at the moment? What is What cultural and behavioral changes are required to migrate and to move into the new way of doing things? The second question that is being raised is, so Dr. Ledger, you have made, and, and then this is what uh, Professor Skippers has also made emphasis on, Implementation capability of government does seem to be a serious handicap. What will change with the coming in of the DDM? What is required of the DDM to address the implementation capability of the state, especially local government? In fact, if we wake up tomorrow and we've jointly planned, we've moved away from alignment, will we have resolved the issue of the capability of the state and what is required of the state to be able to do things differently with the plans at its disposal? This, I think Professor Skippers and uh, uh, Dr. Ledger, is an area that you, were, you, have, you have been harming on and the participants are asking, we hear that and we've heard that during Project Consolidate. The third question 
and I'll pause before I come with the last round of questions. The third question that is being raised in uh, Temba is as follows. Since 1998, there has been many models of government and examples have been given by Professor Skiepers, Project Consolidate, Back to Basics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the question that is being asked is, what's different with the DGM? Is it another model that will disappear with the current administration? And how do you shield the district or institutionalize the district development to survive the changes in the, in the with the changes in administration? I'll pause on these questions and then I'll come back with a, set, a few set of questions. And, and please, panelists, feel free that uh, if I if Kemba starts and you have a view on any of the questions, step in. If I see you not stepping in, I may come from time to time to invite your opinion so that it's it's all engaging. Now I start with you, Temba, if, if it is fine by you. Yeah, no, thanks, uh, 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 Chuchaka, and, and thanks for, for, for the questions. Uh, I think the, the, the first question and the third question, to some extent, uh, are, are related. Uh, I'll try and, and respond to both. What, one of the, 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 when looking at the lessons of the past 25 years uh, and the challenges of uh, silos and, and fragmentation and duplication in how the three spheres uh, implement uh, their program, what, what, what is coming out very clear is that the success of the DDM cannot be uh, dependent on the will of, of sectors, whether they want to cooperate or collaborate. And then one of the areas that we're addressing as part of institutionalizing the DDM is to ensure that uh, DDM finds expression in the planning instruments, in the budgeting instruments, uh, and overall the coordination sort of, of implementation. So we, we've had discussions with Treasury, uh, DPME, uh, to ensure that from a planning side, uh, the frameworks that are issued to department in terms of developing their APPs, their annual performance plans, uh, the principles of spatial sort of uh, logic and, and, and spatial budgeting is incorporated there. So that when they account in their APPs, they are also forced in terms of how the system functions to account for that. And uh, also treasure in terms of special budgeting to ensure that uh, departments can actually, uh, in terms of the budget frameworks, uh, it's incorporated in, in those. So, so, so the idea of institutionalizing is to ensure that the, the, the DDM is institutionalized in the instruments that are already utilized for addressing planning, budgeting, and implementation. When it comes to implementation, we are currently developing regulations uh, in terms of the IGR Act, Section 47, where the minister uh, has powers to, to regulate the alignment uh, or integration of plans across the three spheres. And then th these are measures that, that we're putting in place to ensure that uh, the implementation is just not left to, to sector departments. And then overall, if you institutionalize it in, in those instruments, it then begins to change uh, paradigm, it begins to change behavior and the culture of how we do things because it becomes a, a legislated requirement uh, of how you need to do things. But secondly, the, in relation now to, to the third question, uh, of course, there's, I mean, the point that I made up front was that the DDM cannot be seen as one of the many programs that were implemented previously, which were targeted uh, at local government. So if, if, if you look at the evolution of the local government system, those programs were meant to actually uh, uh, deal with the challenges at the time. So from the, so if you talk about project consolidate, from establishment of local government in 2000, 
there were immediate challenges that we identify. So they, these interventions became part of the evolution of the system of local government, but they were not really meant to provide a coherent framework of all of government that forces all of government to work. Uh, so they were targeted specifically in local government. In fact, even the, the key areas of focus of those programs were largely the key performance areas of municipalities. But with DDM, it's a different approach because firstly, it's predicated on the constitution and the IGR Act. And then secondly, what is different is that uh, it looks at the whole system. Uh, it's not just about local government. How do you ensure that all the three spheres, including sectors outside of government, uh, work uh, in a more coherent way around a common set of objectives that we want to achieve? The IGR Act provides for protocols, as, as, as uh, Prof uh, indicated. And the one plan is going to be a compact, which will be regulated. That one plan is going to be regulated, which will express, uh, uh, it will actually form a basis of an accountability framework for the spheres in terms of their budget commitments in relation to the priorities that are identified. And I think it's, it's, it's important to make the point that uh, so Temba, just on that point, what comes first? Is it regulation or are we proceeding with the one plan processes before regulation is in place? If, if the success of the, the, the joint plan is dependent on compliance based on the regulations that would have been put in place, what comes first? I think the... the what what we are doing so when when cabinet adopted the ddm the president indicated that we don't have the luxury of time to wait uh, to amend legislation introduce new policies and so on so so we're, we're implementing the ddm uh, as we're flying uh, so we're going to fix this plane as we're flying and then we're drawing lessons also as we're implementing so, so some of the points that I'm making, these are uh, uh, instruments that are going to be implemented as we are implementing, uh, 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 introducing the DDM. The, the, the monitoring and evaluation, there are systems that we are putting in place that will ensure that uh, we're able then to, to monitor and measure sort of impact. Uh, but, but of course, this is the first phase of this uh, development of the one plan. So 2021, will be the, the first sort of generation, uh, first generation of the one plan. And as we, in the outer years, we will learn from that and improve as we go along, look at uh, areas that, that we, we need to, to strengthen. Uh, and, and, and yeah, I, I think, let me stop there. Maybe just the last point, my side, on the implementation capability. And I want to agree fully with, with both uh, uh, the panelists, uh, uh, Tracy and, 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 and uh, Prof. The, the, the implementation capability is not just about the skills of the individuals. Uh, so, so you need to look at uh, overall the, the institutional capability of uh, whether the, there's right systems. Uh, so one of the challenges, infrastructure delivery just the management of the planning for infrastructure, managing your sub, uh, supply chain processes. Uh, what systems do we need to put in place to facilitate such processes? But, but of course, it's important to have the right people with the right skills uh, so that then the other uh, systems that you need to put in place provide an enabling uh, environment to achieve your, your, your set uh, objectives. Thank you. Thanks. I think I would be asking uh, Tracy and, and Louis to also bias your response if you're going to deal with the same question around the state capability. Um, what needs to be done? How soon that needs to be done? Is it something that can be done later or is it something that needs to be done as soon as possible if we were to assure the success of the district development model going forward? What are the gaps? What are the structures? What are the institutions that need to be put in place? Yeah, um, thank you. I think that, you know, I mean, to answer, 
the, the, the question was about, you know, will the, will the joint planning address the issue of implementation capability? And the short answer is not necessarily. Um, I think there's, there was a very, very interesting study that was done a, a, that involved a, a very large group of con countries over a multiple period of time by people from the, the Kennedy School of Government. And what they were looking at was the outputs of the state, what, what the state actually does and what it achieves. And what they found is that actually policies and plans have actually got very little impact on what gets done and what got, doesn't get done. In fact, states that have got exactly the same policies, their ability to do things based on that policy varies from 0% to 100%. So the critical issue is the functionality of the state, not um, the, the, the plan it's, it's, itself. So this is why it's absolutely imperative that we think about implementation capability right from the start. And unfortunately, we've got a bad habit of focusing on the plans and we think about implementation capability when things start to go wrong. Um, and we literally cannot afford to do that anymore. We, you know, we have to, and it's not just about money, it's about the expectations of communities that have a legitimate expectation that the state is going to act proactively to improve their lives. Um, you know, and we need to address those things. And 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 when we look at this this idea of implementation um, capability, as as the DDG says, it's it's not just about skills. It's about the entire structure within which this this takes place. Obviously, yes, individual skills, but not just individual skills. Individual skills in context, in relation to what the organization actually needs. So I might have a lot of clever qualifications. I'd have no chance of running a, a water department, for example. I don't have the, the skills that are appropriate to what is, is required in, in that circumstance. Political will is an issue. The nature of the political administrative interface, the relationship between political officials and administrative officials, and how that impacts what gets done and what doesn't get done. The structure. Of, a, of an organization, the spatial structure, the demarcation, um, systems and, and, and processes as the DTG says. I mean, we've worked in, in uh, I think, probably more than half of the municipalities in South Africa. And a lot of the time when we go to very poorly performing municipalities, it's not that everybody there is lazy or unqualified or, or, or corrupt, but they are trying to work in a structure that actually doesn't allow them to do their work. Basic things are neglected, like, like filing. Nobody wants to talk about filing pieces of paper because it's boring, but actually it's absolutely essential to being able to manage a complex organization like a municipality to have basic administrative processes in place, but we don't pay attention to that. The issue of organizational culture is really important. And once again, I think we tend to focus too much on, on issues on, you know, everybody must be ethical in that, but there are other things that are important. We need to create genuine learning organizations. And a learning organization is not a place where everybody's on a course all the time. A learning organization is a place where people can learn from failure, where people can learn from things that doesn't work, where everybody in the organization is not terrified that if they own up to something that goes wrong, they're going to lose their jobs. But where, when things don't work out, this is an ability, an opportunity for everybody to contribute to the organization. We need to create this kind of culture where everybody is involved. I mean, we all know, you can go into a little municipality, there'll be the people that's sitting at the back there, they've been there forever, they know what goes on in that municipality, but nobody ever asks them what they think about how we can improve the, the, the municipality. We don't empower the people in the municipality. So implementation capability is, is, is an extremely complex issue, and it involves working in a cooperative relationship with the people in the municipalities. There's the, I, you know, my sense is, yes, we all understand that there's corruption, we all understand there are things that are going on, but there are also tens of thousands of people that are genuinely trying very hard to do their best under very difficult circumstances. And Sometimes, you know, we need to stop shouting at them. Tracy, can I, can I just say as a former filing clerk in a municipality, thank you for that, eh? I, I think that's, in, that's, that, that, that's very important. That's not, I, don't know, I, I don't have a lot to add. I, I think both, both Demba and, and, and Tracy have said very important things, but, but just one or two things from, from my side that I want to, that I want to add. You know, you know, for me, the, the, one of the, the key shifts away is something that Temba also referred to now. In the previous iterations of, 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 of strategies and support plans and so on, 
it was all, always about provincial and, and national government looking at the capacity of local government. It was never a question of the capacity of the state as a whole to look at things. Right? And what I, what I see in the DDM and what excites me about it is to say that, listen, it's not about local government capacity. I've been involved in a few Section 139 interventions in my life. And every time I tell people, you know what, it might be the local government that has failed, but it's indicative of the whole of the state that has failed. You know, and I think that's important. If, if we get to that point where we say, when we talk about capacity and capabilities, it's about the system, it's about the state as a whole, and not about local government, because local government is only part, it's, it's only a cog in that bigger wheel. And, 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 and we all need to understand that. I think this whole question, and it's, it's coming out, I, I've seen Minister Mtunu now uh, has come out with this whole professionalization uh, 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 framework. I think that is crucially important. It's important that we professionalize the, the public service and I include local government in that. Um, by, by professionalizing the public service, I think we'll move a long way towards insulating public sector officials from undue political influence, from undue political influence, right? We work in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a system where there's political supremacy uh, as the elected uh, representatives that hold the mandate of the people. I think we must understand that. But within the constitutional system, um, those elected representatives must, must not be able to, to, to exert undue influence on, 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 on officials. And unfortunately, that happens to a, to a large extent. So if we, if we professionalize uh, 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 the public service, I think that's a, that's, that's a way of moving towards, towards, towards that, that point. I want to just finally just say that this, this point, and, and Tracy, you, you raised this, and I think this is crucial. Our appetite for innovation and our appetite for making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. I think we need to we need to improve that appetite. At the moment, we almost so I'm sorry, uh, Chair, but we're scared of making mistakes because if you make a mistake, it can be used to get rid of you. And what that what that means is that is that is that we do not explore and get to new ways of doing things, and we get stuck in the old ways of doing things because we're so scared that we'll make a mistake. So, so that appetite for innovation and doing things anew and looking at new ways of doing things, for me, I think that's important. If we can infuse the state with that capability and with that capacity, I think we'll move a long way in, in, in terms of improving things. Let me thank you, uh, panelists. Um, I'm going to ask, that the participants are now going to receive a poll. Please respond to the poll. We will give the outcome of the poll at the end. The poll is asking very specific questions. Um, it's a yes or no in certain in, in the majority of instances, but it will give us an indicator of the perception and the views of the participants on the specific areas that we are asking here. And I see that it has already started to tick and it's moving a bit faster. I want to get back to my panelists with um, the last round of questions. The, the district development model is raising the expectation of people that more will be done and more will be done efficiently. It, read from the question that one of the participants has raised. It's the DGM anticipate one budget or joint budgeting for one plan. Has budgeting for government programs in spaces been a problem, less efficient, less impactful? Will there be new money for the one plan going forward? for more to be done. And I think this is a question that I want to pose to all of the panelists irrespective of whether you are in government or not. The second question, which is one of my last questions that are coming from the, uh, the participants is, government spheres plan and execute in silos. It would appear that the basis of planning evidence stroke information is different. Joint planning will require same, same reference base of information, coordination of spheres, et cetera, et cetera. How will we achieve 
this through the DDM? Or put differently, how can the DDM planning process achieve this? This, I think, uh, says it goes back to the question around if the state currently is planning in silos and it's unable to coordinate its planning because anyway, it uses different reference points and bases for information or evidence. It means the, what they think is important, how they prioritize is different. How can they, through the DDM, achieve this? And I think this will talk to the areas that uh, both Chamber and yourself, Tracy, have raised. To an extent, Louis has raised this issue as well around the fact that we do need the evidence-based uh, planning, but how would we achieve it? You, you want to start, uh, Louis, before I get back to 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 Temba. I see Temba has taken a great chunk in the first round, and uh, and I know he doesn't have a Red Bull by himself. So maybe to give him a chance to recover. You want to start? Go ahead, please. Let me start with with, with the last point: the evidence-based uh, planning that, that that you've referenced. Now, from a municipal perspective, I tell if you speak to most local government officials. They'll tell you that they are so fed up with all the different departments in, 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 in the state, you know, approaching them for information and sometimes for the same information. You know, Department of Water Affairs wants information, then it's human settlements, and then it's province. And so I think what we need to do is to design a framework within which we can get the information that the state needs to make its, 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 its decisions on and where, where it's possible for that information to be to be automated out of the system. Because there's a lot of information in the system that you do not need a person to fill in a, a questionnaire to get that in, right? So I think if we if we do that, if we design for the whole of the state a system where we can extract information from, you know, from your annual financial statements, from your performance uh, plans, from, from all those things, I think we'll reduce the 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 um, the number of times that, 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 that municipalities and I suppose other organs of state are, are, are approached to, to get information. I think by automating and by, like I said in my input, by making sure that we, that we stay on the cusp of, of, of technological advancement, I think we can, we can go a long way towards that. Getting the information is the one part of it. I think having the ability to properly analyze that information is important. You know, to have qualitative capacity in terms of understanding what that information means, I think is important. Um, because just having information means nothing if you can't use that information, if you can't analyze it and use it um, in a way to, 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 to improve um, your planning going forward, I think it, it doesn't mean a lot. So, so, so evidence-based planning, it's, it's important, but then we need to, we need to make sure that we, that we first of all get the, get the data and that we, we are able to analyze the data. I think that's important. I think it's also it's also important that we that we understand that there is a particular global, but also a particular uh, South Africa specific financial context within which we we operate. Um, the reality is that, as a result of COVID, but also as a result of other things, our fiscus is under enormous pressure. So anybody that thinks that the DDM is going to provide new budget and new financing and new funding. Is making a mistake. That's I. I can tell you it's not going to happen. I'm not even in, in the state, right? So so there's a there's a big um, challenge to all of us to see how we can do more with our dwindling resources because our resources are dwindling. So how can we be more effective and more efficient with with the resources that we have? That's one. From a from a local government perspective, I think. You know, the, the, the funding and the financing of district municipalities is something that we need to get sorted out um, going forward, because otherwise the district development model is not gonna, is, is, is not gonna survive, you know? Um, I, I think we need to get this discussion between treasury and COCTA and local government. We need to get this thing sorted about, you know, what, what, what are the, what, what, what are the uh, uh, sources of, finding, of, of, of financing of, of, of district, municipalities. And then on top of that, how do we make sure that there is a, 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 a 
a, a, a system of, of, of transferring into, into districts that do not perhaps have the, the, the economic potential that, that the others have. Because otherwise, I think uh, we are doomed. Otherwise, we're not going to get to the point where we have proper implementation and we'll, we'll have skewed implementation. So in districts where there's economic potential, there'll probably be, be uh, uh, positive growth, but, but in other districts, they'll, they'll lag behind and so on. So for me, I think that's, that's also an important part of what, what, what we should be looking at. So Cheka, I'm going to stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Tamba and Tracy, I do want you to also address the issue of there are so many institutions on which different levels of government rely on information. So you talk statistics South Africa, you talk universities, you talk CSIR, you talk, you talk about so many credible institutions that have different uh, sets of information. Um, will this situation change going forward? Where the state will have a certain center where information can be sourced for purposes of planning? Or will we continue to rely on appointed um, uh, consultants for that moment of compliance to be able to get information? So where will the information, how will we manage the, 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 the information that should be used as evidence to influence planning and budgeting and to be able to monitor the impact of those activities. Chamba, you can, you can start and Tris will probably go ahead. Yeah. Uh, no, thanks uh, to Chamba. Maybe let me let me start with the the, the point that uh, Louis raised on the new money, uh, and 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 just give sort of examples. Uh, and and I agree, uh, DDM is not bringing new money, uh, but but I think what 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 the lessons of the past twenty five years have taught us now. It's how we have not been efficient and effective in utilizing the current allocations, uh, and, and I think this is where we need to, to 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 focus on. Just to give you examples, when we're looking at uh, national programs that are implemented in the pilot site in one uh, district, uh, we, we identified about five departments that were providing training targeting the youth with the budget of over 100 million. So five departments, they're all targeting the youth, they're not talking to each other. And all of them, if you look at the, those training programs, it's all about certification of the youth, just giving the youth certificate. Uh, if, if you then say to those departments, in our tambo, you know that uh, there's 34% unemployment and almost 80% of that is the youth. Uh, a youth that majority don't have any education. So in that specific district, your target is about addressing the challenge of unemployable youth. Uh, you're not talking unemployment generally, but we're saying in this district, this is the challenge that we have. And if there are departments that are providing training programs, how are those training programs designed to respond to that reality of our term, for example. Uh, let me give you another example of, of, uh, of uh, water. Uh, there's always been a view that uh, there's challenges of water in, in, uh, in our term, and there's uh, this Mzimvugu Dam, which is a very big project, which was going to solve all the water challenges of, of, of uh, water bear, of uh, our term. Uh, when we went there, with the minister and the, the Water Research Commission presented the research report that showed that there's so much underground water in that district. But there are no projects or plans on how you, you, you tap into that. So the focus has been on this big Umziv dam that was going to resolve all the problem. So, so if you then look at this and, look and say all the departments that have grants for infrastructure delivery related to water. How do we use those grants 
in that district. So the allocation working also with the municipality. You say, how do we then look at small schemes that can begin to provide uh, uh, water to the people instead of waiting for this long-term big project uh, that is going to require a lot, uh, it's going to be more expensive. So, so, so the issue of, of the DDM not bringing more money, it's about how we improve how we plan uh, in the system currently. There are a lot of resources, but it's how we utilize the current allocations. But if, if we're working on, on the same set of objectives, we're then able to also say, how do we utilize these resources to achieve the, the particular uh, objective? And, and I think that the issue of, uh, I mean, just to emphasize the point raised also of the evidence-based sort of decision making, uh, the success of the DDM is dependent on credible data. And the profiles, we've worked with Status A, we've drawn from, from various sort of research uh, uh, organizations and universities uh, to look at uh, how, how do we improve the credibility of data. So these profiles will be living documents that will be continuously be updated to ensure that they give us the extent of the challenges that we're faced with. So, so you know in each district, what is the extent of poverty, extent of child, and women-headed household, the levels of unemployment, youth unemployment. And this, this, this is the data that must actually be utilized by all spheres. So, so one of the challenges when it comes to spatial planning, a national department, they do their own spatial analysis of that municipal space. The province also does its own analysis of that spatial space including the municipality in terms of its own uh, SDF. So you have three interpretation of what is important about the one space. And it's, it's, it's driven by what each sphere or each sector de de determines as a priority. So, so when it comes together now, uh, the municipality will say, this is where we want to put uh, human settlement. Uh, and the, the department will say, no, they've identified a different space. Uh, economic opportunities are not closer to where people are living because of how we plan. So, so, so this, this is the importance of, of then all of us using the same baseline in terms of understanding what the challenges are, but also in terms of the joint plan to say, this is the plan that addresses infrastructure as it relates to water sanitation. We're all working on the same plans, all our grants, are consolidated, are integrated to respond to the specifics. Uh, the, 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 and I think the, the, the issue of data, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a critical one. Uh, I cannot overemphasize that one. Uh, but, but let me make this point also uh, uh, to check out that DDM is not a panacea for all the ills of local government. And I think we must accept that. So there are other interventions that are required uh, to deal with the other aspects that can improve the overall functionality of the state. But the DDM, it provides us with a, with a model and an operational approach and a programmatic approach to begin then to identify some of those glaring sort of uh, blind spots, which we need to deal with. Uh, but but the, the model itself, it won't address all the political problems, for example. But the political problems are a problem uh, which needs to be addressed as part of this. The electoral cycles, we are dealing with that. In fact, as I've said, that the, the, the one plan, it's meant to express a long-term view, which, which uh, will go beyond the five-year electoral term. And each uh, uh, administration, when it comes in, they will look at how they contribute to that overall sort of plan. But, but, but they're not going to be changing all the priorities all the time, which is what has been happening now. Uh, because there is a clear long-term plan and it's not just a long-term plan of the municipality, it's a long-term plan of the state as a whole, which is aligned to achieving the national development goals. Uh, thanks. Um, so if I can just jump in and then Sarah, if you have any questions. Um, I actually want to um, answer a question that you sort of asked. 
<laughs> at the beginning and, and reflecting on, on both what um, Louis and, and Timber said, and that was the issue of community expectations. Um, and um, the, the issue that there isn't going to be more money. In fact, the, the state is, is very resource constrained, which means that prioritization, choosing what to do and what not to do is going to be a very important issue. And, and how do you manage choosing not to do things against community expectations? And this is something you know, that, that I think is, is perhaps not as well addressed in, in the current planning process, particularly the IDP process, as well as it could be. We have these consultation sessions with communities and they say we want A, B, C, D, E, F, and and everyone behaves as if they're going to get it, um, or everyone behaves as if you know this is the only thing that that counts. We don't see um, real active engagement with municipalities to 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 with um, communities to sit down with communities and say, look, this is how much money we have in our infrastructure budget. Okay, yes. You would like to have these things, but actually, you know, we want to, you know, explain to you that actually we need to make a big investment in our water infrastructure or our sanitation infrastructure so that in three, four, five years down the line, you know, if, if community members are, are, are not stupid. They can understand the value of these things, but we never take them into our confidence and say, you know what, this is actually what we need to do so that in three or four years' time, there is water coming out of the taps. We've only got so much money, we whatever. This process where we go to communities and say, tell us what you want and then act as if we we're going to deliver it and then five years later we haven't and then we're we're surprised that everyone's like fed up about it we need to have a different way under the current circumstances of taking the community into our confidence and, and sharing information with them and saying this is the reality these are the decisions that we're going to make and take people along so that there is ownership of this this isn't just about ownership of one plan by national provincial and local government it's about ownership of the plan by everybody who lives in this spatial unit by everybody who lives in the place and we and we can't take people along on the journey until they understand why we have made certain decisions and I, and I think that that is a very very important part of the, of a, a, having a really different approach towards planning so that this is something that people participate in not to check you are muted sorry I was saying that we're about 10 minutes away from the, the, the end of the session uh, there are yet a lot more questions that have been asked uh, by participants um, I think we'll also make these questions available to the organizers uh, and we'll share these questions with all the participants to the extent that we can be able to create a platform where some of the answers are provided, we'll continue to do so. But I want to propose that we, we probably close the question and answer session at this point and thank the panelists for for, for making your best to address some of the questions that have been uh, raised. We are going to take the, the results of the polls. There has been a poll that has been raised with the participants here, but before we go there, I want to see if these uh, key um, uh, observations are important from this today's uh, session. I think um, what we have been able to pick up from a few of our panel, the three panelists, is that we do need accurate and detailed information in order to develop good plans to ensure that our plans are anchored in the reality of the socioeconomic environment uh, that planning is taking place in. Additionally, the purpose of evidence is to enable effective decision making. And um, that is that information has no intrinsic value as Tracy has, has, has said, is not intrinsic value on its own, but only as an input into the decision making, um, especially in the planning and budgeting processes. Then we must think very critically about two key issues that Tracy has raised and most uh, of the other panelists have raised as well. First is that all planning in the public sector involves trade-offs. And because it involves trade-offs, we have to make choices. And this is critical for our prioritization. What we have still to establish from the discussion we had today is that we need to still work harder 
in establishing on how we generate this evidence, this information for all of the state so that reliance on the credible information is not all over. And I think it's an area that we can still work on as we proceed with the evolution of the district development model. The second, the second point is obviously that the set of evidence that we need is the information that, that can tell us in a detailed and objective fashion why some programs are more important than others and why others um, uh, cannot be preferred and how we communicate based on evidence to the affected communities why certain programs will make a better impact than, than some. We also have picked up in the conversation that the critical point is that we need to plan for implementation. We need to have detailed plans for exactly how we are going to achieve a particular goal. Planning for implementation and how we are going to achieve what we intend for seems to have come out as a very important theme in the conversation today. And I guess this is a takeaway that the, 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 the district development model people that are working on it now are going to have to work very hard on. Lastly, we have also picked up in the conversation that the capability of the state is very important, both in the planning, in the budgeting, and in the execution. And that the reference to capability here would mean skills, it would mean technology, it would mean putting institutions, putting structures in place, putting processes, putting um, all the me me mechanisms that enable the state to function and to be predictable in the way it, it, it executes its, um, its mandate. I think Temba has raised a point that we have a plane that needs to be fixed while it's in the air. Um, legislative enablers to change the culture and behavior, behavioral changes of the state at various levels does seem to be a question that participants have raised and a very important point. How do we get the state to change from how it is over the last 26 years done its things without relying on what the legislation is saying? Or is legislation going to be fast-tracked enough to enable uh, the state and organs of the state to feel comfortable that in executing their work, they are not breaching the law? Lastly is the special location of government programs does seem to emerge as well as a very important element of the district development model. And the fact that we, reference has been made that previous programs have spoken to local government and not all of the state does seem to be a very important differentiator of the district development from previous initiatives. This summary does not capture everything that we have been discussing today. It is but just a high level capture of some of the issues that seem to have come out of the conversation here. There, is, there are teams that have been working behind the scene that are going to elaborate on this summary and they will make it available to the participants that are here. At this point, I want to ask Shannon to come on board to share with us what the results of the poll are. This is a measure of how the participants in this session are seeing the district development model on the various aspects that have been raised in the poll. Shannon, you there? Thanks, Chicheka. Yes, I've just shared the poll results now. As you can see, majority of the responses have been quite positive with the question of, is the DDM achievable? We got a percentage of 73% said yes. So that's good news. Um, the second question, do we have evidence demonstrating the success of localizing and spatializing in the context of local government initiatives? That was 59% no, but I don't think we should see that as a negative thing. We can see that as something to work towards. And then the third question, does South Africa have real prospects in achieving the vision of the DDM? And we got an overwhelming yes at 69%.
So I think this is quite positive. And I think our panelists have given good indication of the DDM for the government. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, to the panelists, I think uh, you've been, the results are a better indicator of the fact that you have elaborated on the various aspects and have created the confidence in the system that the district development model does seem to create a hope for the future. At this point, I want to ask Xavier McMaster. Xavier is the head of the program management office of the district development model. He's been listening very attentively. Uh, the failure and the success of the district development model means he and the broader the team that is involved uh, are in a space where they are watching and listening if they are taking the right direction in directing the program. Xavier, I want to ask you to uh, pass a vote of thanks uh, first to yourself for making this to happen and, and secondly, probably to everybody else as you may elect to do so. Thank you very much. Xavier, your chair. Thank you um, to Cheka. Um, I think um, the poll is also making us end uh, this particular dialogue session on a very positive note. Uh, but colleagues and friends, um, I'd just like to express our sincere gratitude and appreciation. Uh, firstly, to Mr. Chwene Rampele for his opening remarks on behalf of the DBSA and his emphasis on the importance that the bank places on its role as an organ of state and trusted partner of government to meaningfully contribute to economic growth and building state institutional capacity to tackle the pervasive challenges of poverty, unemployment, inequality, and underdevelopment in our country. Um, I also just want to apologize on behalf of DG Avril, who had some uh, connectivity challenges, uh, but we will definitely share uh, uh, input with you, um, which would have provided quite a comprehensive scene setting around uh, what is the current implementation status of the DDM and what are the next steps and vision uh, for the DDM uh, going forward. <clears throat> to our esteemed panelists, um, Dr. Ledger, Professor Skepers, uh, Mr. Temba Fossi, thank you so much for your well-considered, insightful and thought-provoking contributions. I think your participation in this dialogue has contributed immensely to its success. To our moderator stroke program director, Mr. Chucheka Mklongo, thank you for your professional and proficient steering of this afternoon's proceedings. The organizing team led by Desiree Mojanaga from the bank's communications, marketing and events unit, colleagues from DCOC, uh, the PMO, <clears throat> the knowledge management unit and engineering news, who really work tirelessly behind the scenes to make this event a success. Thank you for a job well done. Colleagues, our data shows that around 1,300 participants dialed into today, and this gives us immense confidence, and I think a good platform to build a community of active citizenship and public service by regularly engaging with you, seeking your insights, and to keep you updated on the DDM developments as we progress. I'm sure you'd agree with me that this is no small task, but it will require a consistent, collective, and relentless effort to socialize and institutionalize, to align, and to bring everyone on board across all three spheres of government, civil society, development partners, the private sector and media towards our common vision of building a better and more prosperous country and life for all our communities and our people. 
just to let you know that we are currently reviewing all uh, the comments and suggestions that you've made during the buildup of this event, as well as the questions that you posted on the Q&A that we could not answer today due to time constraints, but we will definitely use those ideas to engage more and to sharpen our implementation pencils. I promise you that this is not just another dialogue, this is an engagement that opens many other opportunities for collaboration to get things done so that the people of our country can feel and see the tangible difference that the DDM is making in their everyday lives. Thank you for your support and thank you for sharing this important engagement with us. Remember the DDM team is only a phone call and email away. Please do keep the conversation going on social media and digital media and hold us accountable to our commitments. Till next time, keep well and keep safe and let us heed the call of observing all the COVID-19 protocols at all, th all times. Thank you and goodbye. Hmm. I will hand over to Shana. Thanks so much, Tucheka. From Crema Media Events, I would like to take this opportunity to thank each of our panelists for joining us today. And thank you to the attendees for taking the time to join this webinar, as well as for sending us all your questions and comments. I hope you found it enjoyable and informative. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course. Thank you for your time. Stay well and goodbye.